This Debaco University video will go over improving flower mass and metabolites with high light intensity. The goal here is to maximize your yield and production while minimizing your cost to ensure your grow is as efficient as possible. As always, I like to provide the source of the article. If you want to read and get the details from the actual authors, here's a link to the article. Here's that front page. So you can take a look at it. I'm going to provide a summary and a grower recommendation at the end. So light specifics are used in this climate controlled chamber. Well, it's important to understand what they were utilizing for the environmental conditions here. And this was a, a light study. So they were looking at different light intensities and they were measuring what's called the PPFD, which you're not aware of. It's the idea of a light source of course produces these photons, but we're looking at how many accumulate over a area uh, per a second of time. So we're not just measuring what the light's producing, meaning those um, photons can go anywhere. We're really measuring the ones that can be quote collected. So these ones that kind of go off and don't get uh, on that area where the plant leaf area might be, those aren't counted in this type of measurement. So that makes this a really powerful unit of measurement. Uh, so they were looking at, this is the breakdown of the percent blue, green, red, and far red. And as a reminder, those are different wavelengths in nanometers. Uh, their photo period was in 18 6, 18 hours of light, 6 hours of dark. The PPFD and spectrum were measured at 45 centimeters above the table, which was the final canopy height during the vegetative stage, and applied during the flowering phase 8 weeks with a 12 hour photo period. This gives you a little background of what they were actually studying. In addition, the climate um, for the vegetative phase, 0 to 11 days after transplant, there were 28.7 to 26.3 degrees Celsius in the light versus the dark phase, 79% uh, percent relative humidity during the light, 86 at, on the, during the dark phase. During the flowering phase, 12 to 69 days after uh, transplant, the climate was slightly adjusted. You can see pretty much kept the same 20 degrees Celsius light, 26.7 degrees Celsius dark, 71 and 75 relative humidity respectively. The cultivar grown here just uh, is called the critical CBD. It's a chemo type two with an um, intermediate THC CBD ratio of approximately 0 0.5. All right, let's get into some of the data that they provided so we can take a look at the details of this study. Here we're looking at the relative abundance of cannabinoids in the flower. Concentrations of detected cannabinoids increased with an increase in the PPFD. So what this kind of shows here, which is nice, it shows the total cannabinoids, and we can see here uh, the increase, the relative abundance of dry mass cannabinoids in flower of cannabis grown under 600, 800, and 1,000 micromoles per meter per second. Uh, data point six is the um, white, uh, seven is the gray points, and eight is the black points. We can see this duration of time measured in weeks here. And we see the overall cannabinoids increasing. However, they took it a step further and provided us with the details here of what CBD, THC, CBN, THCV, CBG, and CBC were all doing. We can see these general trends were very consistent amongst all of them because sometimes you might get light Intensities might push one or another. So we're seeing slight variations, overall increase in total cannabinoids, as well as increase in all of the individual ones measured here. Continuing on with some of the data here, the relative abundance of terpenes in the flowers. So they were looking at both the, the sequitur terpenes uh, and the monoterpenes. And they increased literally with PPFD in plants during the six to eight weeks into the generative phase. So the total terpene concentration in fresh flower increased by 76% with a 67% increase in light intensity. So the increase was mainly observed for individual monoterpenes, as we can see when we break this down, but overall total terpenes did increase. Now, again, there's two main categories. So we're seeing one group here and one group here. Again, overall increase. That relative abundance of dry mass terpenes in the flower of cannabis grown under 600, 800, and 1,000 micromoles per meter uh, per second. PPFD after six, seven, and eight weeks into the flowering phase. And we're seeing those represented by six is representing the white points, seven the gray, eight the black, just like the previous slide. Again, overall an increase, if there's a particular terpene of interest to you, you can look at the specifics, but we're, we are seeing an overall increase in the previous slide in cannabinoids and here again in terpenes. 
So when we're looking at those uh, breakdown here, we're looking at after eight weeks into the flowering phase, we're looking at the plant dry mass represented in this upper left-hand quadrant. Then we're looking at the dry mass uh, partitioning, we're looking at dry mass content and light use efficiency. Data is based on two replicate experiments, each consisting of 30 and 18 plants per treatment. When linear effects of light intensity were significant, meaning P greater than 0.05, trend lines were depicted. So we can see where trend lines are depicted and where they are not. So we were looking at the inflorescence in the blue, the leaf in the green, the stem, and then the total plant. And looking at the general trends here, as we see dry mass increasing along with the inflorescence, uh, the leaf and the stem pretty much mirroring each other very closely here for dry mass content. Again, we're seeing how these are all looking at the um, uh, light use efficiency um, as well. We need to take that into consideration as we'll see the importance of maintaining high efficiencies with the data here. Now after that um, eight weeks of flower, we're seeing also, now we're looking at plant height, diameter of the main stem, plant compactness, leaf area, and specific leaf area. And this first one here is height, then we go to diameter of main stem, plant compactness, and then a leaf area. The data is based again on two replicate experiments, each consisting of 30 and 18 plants per treatment. When linear effects of light intensity were significant at 0.05, trend lines were depicted. We're seeing the evidence of that here. So again, looking at the light intensity, plant compactness, plant height, leaf area, and main stem diameter. So they were very detailed in this study. What about response curves here? So now we're looking at response curves of net photosynthesis. And we're gonna see how this all kind of comes together at the end, but I like to provide you with the data as I know many of you like to really get into the really specifics of some of these studies. So here we're looking at cannabis grown under 600, 800, and 1,000 micromoles again, three, five, and seven weeks into the flowering phase. Now what you'll notice is at week three, they peaked the in, um, intensity here at 2000, but for weeks five and seven, they also were investigating and looking at upwards of 3000 uh, micromoles per meter uh, per second there. And again, we can see some slight differences here. Again, A representing uh, what they're looking like at three weeks. Green represents the 600 um, micromoles. Blue represents the 800. And red is representing the 1,000. We could see kind of how they may have separated a little bit, but then they come together here at week seven. So derived from light response curves, what can we kind of conclude from all of that? Well, we've got here the parameters uh, maximum estimated for photosynthesis rate. We've got the apparent quantum yield, the light compens compensation point, and the dark respiration. All of these really getting into those really physiological details of the plant because we need to look at all aspects. Yes, we want to look at, yes, terpenes and cannabinoids, but are we affecting something else? And what are we seeing? What is going to be that peak or that, quote, best or that really at the end here recommended light intensity? So you've got to look at many of them in many different aspects of plants. The symbols represent three to five plants measured in replicate for experiment two. Uh, ribbons in A and C, so here A to C, A to C. Uh, in error bars in D and G represent standard error means, and those A and C are the one, previous one. When effects of light intensity, again, were significant, 0.05, asterisks for A and C, or different letters A to G were depicted. So that area of significance is important because it kind of gives you the odds that what the parameters were for the experiment caused the change, and it didn't just happen by chance. So this is kind of a nice little um, kind of flow chart, if you will, as they look at the effects of light intensity during the eight weeks into flower. And we're seeing uh, yield of specialized metabolites per plant in cannabinoids and terpenes both increased. We saw a, they, they saw a concentration of specialized metabolites per gram of dry mass for, again, cannabinoids and terpenes. The inflorescence dry mass per plant increased. The total plant dry mass, the dry mass partition of inflorescence, the leaf index increased, the photosynthetic rate all increased, the leaf dry mass increased. The only thing that decreased was specific leaf area. And that kind of makes sense. When plants are under really high intense light, a lot of times they sense that and they will actually have smaller leaves. They don't need that large area to collect the sun and the light. They can get away with the same light with having less leaf area. This is why these different parameters need to be investigated because sometimes that reduction in surface area could cause secondary effects. So when we're looking at kind of what does this kind of study kind of relate to? What's kind of the, some of the take-home messages here? So with increasing yield, 
uh, increased in yield with increased light intensity. Yield of special, specialized metabolites, specifically looking at cannabinoids and terpenes, and you can look at the individual cannabinoids and terpenes in some of the graphs I presented earlier, strongly increased in both their concentration and flower yield with increasing light intensities, and going from 600 to 1,000. Within this range of light intensities, the inflorescence yield showed a proportionally increase with light intensity, meaning that light use efficiency remained consistent. So we want to mean, keep, remain consistent and efficient with our growing operation. Now, increased yield, again, due to the dry matter, higher inflorescence yield was mainly due to higher total plant dry matter production, to a lesser extent due to an increase in the fraction of dry mass uh, partitioned to the inflorescence. So again, we're increasing light intensity, increasing yield, increasing, you know, that greater plant dry biomass, just more plant material if you will. And just as a reminder, we're looking about 18 hour photo period here, then being switched over to a 12 hour photo period for that eight weeks of flower. And you can see what some of their plants look like under 600, 800, and 1000. Now, what's interesting about cannabis, and before I get to the recommendation, I want you to understand that leaf photosynthesis rate kept on increasing up to the highest measuring light level of 3,000 micromoles per meter per squared. This indicates that cannabis is a species with exceptionally high photosynthetic capacity. So what I want to do is I want to present these two little graphs here to give you a meaning for what this 3,000 micromoles per meter per second square means, because that may just be just a number to you. When we're looking at here, they, this, um, these researchers were looking at PAR readings in southern Spain uh, during the course of the time of day in July and February, and then we're looking at basically the sun intensity for houseplants going all the way up to full sun. So when we're looking at here outdoor operations and maximized full sun, so when we're outside on a July day during the peak of the day, you could see the full sun is maximizing somewhere around 2200-ish, uh, 2200 micromoles per meter per second squared. You see that also correlated down here with maximum sun intensity being 2200 micromoles per meter uh, per second squared. However, this, these researchers looked up to 3000 so this intensity of light is technically greater intense than an outdoor plant on a, a day with no clouds would experience. And they did see increasing levels all the way up to that. That means this cannabis is a species with that high photosynthetic capacity. It can handle very intense light. However, when it comes to indoor growing, the investment of generating high light intensities must be balanced by the cost and return on input data. So this is where we need to have those check and balance systems. We can add more light and get more, yes, but if we're adding double the amount of light and only getting a smidge more, is it really worth it in the end, especially with all the cost of heat and lighting? So what's, this, what's the recommendation then? After all this data, all this information, which you're welcome to look at the study, the recommendation would be if you're indoor growing, you want to aim for 1,000 micromoles per meter per second squared of light. This offers the highest yield while still justifying the cost to generate this level of light intensity. This is where getting a uh, PAR meter, understanding the um, light intensity in your area and how it might differ from directly under the light to at the edges or corners where the light source might be. This is where understanding these maps, taking good readings and trying to maintain a thousand micromoles per meter per second squared of um, of light is going to be very important because that's the way you're going to generate the highest yields of both cannabinoids and terpenes while still doing it in at least the most cost-effective way possible based on this research.